Guten Abend, meine sehr verehrten Damen und Herren. Herzlich willkommen zum zweiten Tag der Veranstaltung Ukraine 30. Vielleicht zu erinnern, für alle, die gestern nicht da waren. Gestern haben wir über das Massaker in Baden Jahr gesprochen, über die Erinnerung daran heute in der Ukraine, aber auch in Deutschland. Und heute werden wir die 30 Jahre der Unabhängigkeit der Ukraine in den Fokus nehmen. Und ich freue mich sehr, unsere Gäste heute begrüßen zu dürfen. Das ist Marie-Louise Beck, die das erste Panel moderieren wird. Sie ist Bundestagsabgeordnete gewesen in der Bündnis 90 Die Grünen und ist jetzt die Geschäftsführerin des Zentrums Liberale Moderne, ähm, bei dem ich mich sehr herzlich auch bedanken möchte für die Kooperation heute, genauso wie für, äh, bei der Deutschen Gesellschaft für Osteuropakunde. Ich möchte auch herzlich begrüßen den Pro Professor Rory Finnin äh, von Cambridge Ukrainian Studies. Rory. Äh, und Volodymyr Jermolenko, äh, gekommen aus Wien, ursprünglich aus der Ukraine. Herzlich willkommen. Das zweite Panel, ja. Oder äh, besser gesagt, eine Lesung äh, wird moderiert durch Claudia Date. Claudia Date ist preisgekrönte Übersetzerin aus dem Ukrainischen, Russischen und Polnischen. Ähm, sie ist die Trägerin des ersten Preises äh, für das Übersetzen aus dem Deutschen ins Ukrainische, Dragoman-Preises, in diesem Jahr bekommen. Und sie wird moderieren Lesung mit, ähm, ich würde sagen, wie sagt man das auf Deutsch? Gestirn? Der ukrainischen Literatur, das sind äh, Juri Andrukovic, äh, Andrei Kurkov, Tanja Malerchuk und Serhii Jadan. Ähm, Juri Andrukovic äh, ist hier vorne, Andrei Kurkov ist da hinten und Tanja Malerchuk und Serhii waren gestern da und verspäten sich ein bisschen. Kommen sicherlich zur Lesung. Und danach möchte ich Sie herzlich noch zum Konzert einladen, einer ukrainischstämmigen Sängerin Ganna Griniva und des israelischen Musikers Tal Aditi ähm, und äh, zu einem kleinen Get-Together. So, das sind ganz kurz, ähm, eine ganz kurze Einführung zu den Inhalten. Ich möchte mich auch sehr herzlich bedanken äh, für die Möglichkeit, ganz kurz zu sprechen. Meistens macht das Thomas Kruger, der heute auch dabei ist, der Präsident der Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung. Vielen Dank für die Unterstützung auch gestern und ich freue mich. Ähm, ja, jetzt äh, komme ich zu einem Teil, äh, der äh, leicht ähm, angepasst wurde an die Gegenwart oder an die heutigen Tage. Äh, ich bitte Sie alle, auch wenn Sie sitzen, die Maske zu tragen. Wir haben zwar Fenster, wir öffnen sie gleich. Ähm, leider ist es, sind die Zahlen nicht so tröstlich, dass wir die Masken abnehmen können. Also nur die, die reden und auf der Bühne stehen, dürfen die Masken abnehmen. Genau. Vielen Dank. Und vergessen Sie bitte äh, nicht, äh, die Masken auch in den Außenräumen zu äh, tragen. Wenn Sie zu Get Together kommen, beachten Sie bitte Abstand. Ähm, gestern habe ich gesagt, auch nach zwei Glas Wein. Vergessen Sie das bitte nicht. Ich möchte mich noch sehr herzlich bedanken, und das ist das Letzte, bei zwei Dolmetscherinnen, die uns heute Abend begleiten, sind Sophia Onufrid und Ludmilla Schneer. Also wenn Sie Ukrainisch nicht verstehen oder Deutsch nicht verstehen, bitte Kopfhörer nehmen. Und ich möchte mich bei, dem, bei den Mensch, Menschen bedanken, eigentlich, die ähm, organisatorisch unglaublich viel gearbeitet haben und diese Veranstaltung unter diesen schwierigen Bedingungen ermöglicht haben. Das ist das Team der BPW, meine Kolleginnen und Kollegen, da hinten Christina Menke, meine Kollegin Katharina Berg und heute Konstanze Söder noch dabei und Leon Lehmann, die Sie in Empfang genommen haben. Ja, vielen Dank und ich wünsche Ihnen einen interessanten, austauschreichen Abend und ich freue mich auf die neuen Gedanken und die Ideen zu Ukraine 30. Dankeschön. Einen herzlichen guten Abend Ihnen alle. Eigentlich wollen wir näher zusammenrücken, politisch und kulturell. Und dieses verdammte kleine Virus hindert uns ein bisschen daran. 
Und das ist nicht nur, dass es ungemütlich ist, mit solchen Masken und auch noch weit voneinander entfernt zu sitzen. Ich empfinde es tatsächlich auch als zunehmend schmerzhaft, dass Begegnung, die doch nicht aus der Welt geschafft werden kann und die durch das Netz nicht ersetzt werden kann, wie wir alle gelernt haben in den letzten anderthalb Jahren, die physische Erfahrung, sich anzulächeln, sich auch mal anzufassen oder zu streiten, dass das alles schmerzlich fehlt in diesen Zeiten. Und man, man merkt es auch politisch. Ich habe wirklich fast etwas Sorge um einen neuen Deutschen Bundestag mit 700 neuen Abgeordneten, von denen ein Drittel ganz neu sind und viele sicherlich Mittelosteuropa auch von den Älteren bisher nicht gut kennen, in Zeiten, wo sie nicht reisen können. Denn sonst würden wir sie auf die Reise schicken oder wir würden ihnen auf die Pelle rücken. Aber all das ist ja derzeit nicht erlaubt. Trotzdem wenigstens so, wir wollen nicht undankbar sein. Es ist schon angekündigt worden, äh, Rory Finn, äh, Professor für Urbanistik äh, an der Universität Cambridge. Er wird Englisch sprechen, viele werden das sicher auch so verstehen. Und ich glaube, jenseits ähm, ein bisschen Neid, dass es in Cambridge offenbar ein Ukrainian Studies Zweig gibt, beschäftigt er sich mit einem, ich würde sagen, hochexplosiven Thema, nämlich der Frage von, Frage von Sprache und Identität. Und mit Sprache und Identitätsfragen kann man eine gesamte Gesellschaft in die Luft jagen. Und zwar nicht nur in der Ukraine, sondern auch in Belgien, wie wir wissen, und in vielen anderen Ländern. Tatsächlich ein absolut brisantes und emotional sehr in die Tiefe gehendes Thema. Und ich freue mich sehr äh, heute Abend über Ihren Vortrag, mit dem Sie uns erst einmal ein bisschen vorlesen werden, wie sich das für einen Professor gehört. Und dann haben wir hier nach Volodymyr Jamolenko, der derzeit an dem Lehrstuhl für Menschenrechte, heißt das, ist das richtig? Lehrstuhl für Menschenrechte. Etwas auch verbunden mit dem Namen Timothy Snyder, der einen großen Durchbruch für uns alle gemacht hat, für unsere Köpfe und unser Denken. Er ist Philosoph, er arbeitet dort derzeit in Wien. Er, man kann bei ihm nachlesen bei den Internet News Ukraine. Wir, er hat auch bei auf Ukraine Verstehen veröffentlicht, wenn ich das bitte schnell mal sagen darf. Und äh, gibt heraus... Ähm, Essays by Ukrainian Intellectuals. Intellectuals sind immer sehr kompliziert, wie wir wissen von uns selber. Ich gucke gerade Herrn Andrukovic an. Und er unterrichtet auch an der kiew mohöna Akademie und ist Mitglied von PEN Ukraine. Ich glaube, das reicht erstmal. Die große Frage Ukraine in Europa. Und ich darf sagen, damit sind wir schon ein großes Stück weiter. Denn ich erinnere mich, dass der Slogan auf dem Maidan. Do you speak German or shall I switch to English? No, please continue. No problem. Okay. Ähm, dass der Slogan auf dem Maidan war: Wir wollen nach Europa. Und ich habe immer gesagt: Leute, ihr seid Europa. Ich gebe zu, dass wir in der etwas hochnäsigen EU westorientiert das immer wieder vergessen. Wir werden immer mächtiger daran erinnert, dass Mittelosteuropa dazugehört hat und dazugehört und hoffentlich noch mehr dazugehören wird. Und deswegen werden wir genau darüber sprechen, was hinter uns liegt und welche Strecke vor uns liegt. Now you have the floor. Guten Abend. Damen und Herren, Dobroho Vechera, Schönobni, Panie Panowie, 
Uh, good evening. Uh, I get to say I'm sorry for my English uh, today. Um, it is really wonderful to be here with you, um, to be invited to participate in this uh, very special uh, program this week. I've been so impressed with the uh, vibrant events that uh, our colleagues uh, at uh, BPB have put together. Um, and so I'm, I'm very happy to uh, talk to you today about um, a very broad topic, um, not only the uh, achievement of 30 years of Ukrainian independent statehood, but also uh, the place of Ukraine, the condition of Ukraine, the idea of Ukraine uh, in Europe today. And I think uh, it's a lot to do in the 20 minutes I have allotted before our discussion, and there's really a wonderful irony in having an American like me who works at a uh, university in a country that has left the European Union begin what will be very certainly uh, a dynamic series of discussions um, and performances on the subject of Ukraine in Europe today, especially when we have wonderful luminaries in arts and in philosophy from Ukraine. Uh, part of me really wants to just uh, stand back and get out of the way, um, but I won't do that uh, because I've been asked to uh, talk to you a little bit about my perspective um, as a professor, as an educator, who really has, a, I think, a, a front row seat to an unfolding success story. Um, I've talked to some of you about this uh, today. The development of Ukraine as an object of study, an object of discovery in uh, European academic space. And I think to understand Ukraine in Europe is in some ways to understand Ukrainian studies in Europe. And we grapple with this uh, growing field, we can begin to see where Ukraine and Europe will be in another 30 years, when our students become the, the leaders, the uh, writers, politicians uh, of the future. So um, in thinking through what to talk to you about on the topic of Ukraine and Europe, um, I thought I'd begin with a story of a happy accident. So I arrived in Cambridge in 2008, um, and immediately I had to confront these rather strange British traditions, and with an Irish background, that's not too easy. Um, and I had to become accustomed to these peculiar work rhythms, many of which involved students submitting essays to me every two weeks um, on material they have studied in our courses in Ukrainian literature and culture. Now, uh, as you can imagine, a lot of these essays reached me in the middle of the night, um, well past certain deadlines, uh, and when students came to discuss their essays with me in these two-on-one -on -one settings, uh, they often look drawn and haggard and exhausted and beaten down. So in a moment of sympathy, uh, I said to some of them, again, half-jokingly, that they could submit a poem in place of an essay if they felt particularly rushed and pressured, thinking, of course, that writing a poem is actually infinitely more complex and more difficult than, than writing an essay. Um, so I made this offer to them. Weeks went by. Um, no one took me up on the offer until one day one of my students submitted this piece of verse in response to a poetry, uh, in, in response to reading the poetry of Vasil Stus, uh, one of U Ukraine's great 20th century poets, um, a figure who is often remembered for very complex, uh, philosophically ornate, one might say, eclectic poems, a figure who, because of his creativity, his rights work, was imprisoned in the Gulag where he died in 1985. So I wanted to begin, perhaps unusually, was killed um, in 1985. And what I'd like to uh, do is share with you, just take a moment to share with you uh, a, a poem that this student submitted. Each moment of yours expanded for an eternity of being, born on a burial ground, and maybe your words were your children, or is that the other way around? There was so much community in your loneliness, so many eyes and we's in your you's, a something you won just by being alive, so you really had nothing to lose. Not the intimacy you locked in a wheelbarrow, nor the leather tongue love in a shoe, and repression was only a metaphor for something that's smaller than you. But this of all things is reductive, the inexpressible can't be expressed, but it can be laughed with and laughed at, not written in scars on your chest. 
So take this, my friendly epistle, my son clarinet without name. In some ways, there's just no comparison. In others, it's exactly the same. Though my heart is amputated by paper cuts and my skin falls into its own pores, my you shatters into infinity signs and scatters in the clouds with yours. Now, uh, those of you who have been fortunate enough uh, to study Ukrainian literature and culture will, will notice immediately how ambitious this poem is, how deeply referential it is to works of Ukrainian poetry and Ukrainian literature over centuries. So it jumps from allusions to the work of Lina Kostanko and Vasil Stus, again in the 1960s and 70s, to the work of Pablo Tichina, particularly the early poetry of Pablo Tichina in the 19-teens, 1920s, to, of course, the poetry of Taras Shevchenko in the middle of the 19th. So this is just a little capsule, a little snapshot, in a sense, of Ukraine in Europe, of themes, ideas, discourses from Ukrainian culture absorbed into lines of verse written by a hurried undergraduate from Manchester, probably in the middle of the night, um, uh, who procrastinated with his essay precisely because he was reading Stu's closely. So, putting aside the uh, circumstances of its composition, the poem, I think, is emblematic of a practice that I often call Ukrainian studies in three dimensions. The three dimensions being conceptual depth, cultural and stylistic breadth, and chronological length. So the chrono chronological length you can see by virtue of the jumping around between time periods, between cultural figures uh, in this particular poem. The conceptual depth actually shows us the student exploring this push and pull uh, of lyric address, this tension between an I, a you, a we, as well as Stuss's concern for anamnesis, this journey into the, into the uh, uh, authentic self. Um, and as far as linguistic uh, cultural breadth, there are touches here, gestures to Tsvetaeva and Rilke as well. So clearly, every object of knowledge, um, every academic subject deserves to be treated and approached in three dimensions, but it is precisely uh, three dimensions that have eluded the study of Ukraine in Europe for a very long time. So um, we see even today, uh, more than seven years after the onset of Russia's aggression, military, economic, political, and cultural, we see that Ukraine may not be terra incognita any longer, that is, it's on the intellectual map, but it's just not traveled. But it remains uh, uh, Europe's terra mala cognita. That is, it's poorly studied, poorly understood, as a diverse and very dynamic intellectual space um, uh, working through conversations, experiences, and traditions all the time. This is what Carl Schlegel calls Europe in miniature. And I think we've just been uh, slow or reluctant to look in the mirror and acknowledge this reflection. Now, I say this uh, not to moan, uh, to shake my fist at the sky, as I mentioned to Volodymyr yesterday. Um, this is something Ukrainianists have been prone to do over the years. But rather, I simply want to gesture to new approaches that overcome what I see as two perennial and very problematic issues with respect to the study of Ukraine uh, in Europe. And the first is uh, presentism, or inversely, uh, this excessive focus on the historical past. Uh, this is a problem in which um, Ukraine is understood as having a clock begin after 1991, or uh, as if its darkest periods of history determined its direction and identity in some fundamental way. So this is a focus on now, or it's a focus on then, but it's not a focus or concern with meanwhile, with the spaces in between. This is still missing. Since 2014, for instance, um, in, I think, European journalistic analytical discourse, we see this habit creep in time and time again. It, it appeared quite often with uh, references to Maidan 
uh, the revolution of dignity birthing a, quote, new nation, without much awareness and without much acknowledgement that this civic nation that's been open and disposed to a multinational uh, democratic Ukrainian polity has been around for a very long time. It's, it's not anything new. We just need to look for it, of course. Look for it in, for instance, the history of the Ukrainian People's Republic to the third universal, the Treti Universal of November 1917, which was published in a broadside in four languages, Ukrainian, Russian, Polish, and Yiddish. The second problematic issue is uh, an asymmetry between the social sciences and the humanities with respect to the study of Ukraine. And this is particularly uh, problematic in Great Britain, where Ukraine really appears as a creature of politics and economics, but really not a creature of culture. So outside of a few um, really extraordinary dissertations of the past year, uh, the study of Ukraine's music, visual art, literature, uh, has been very rare, relatively rare. Now, of course, um, we all contend with crises in the humanities as a field um, more generally around the globe, certainly with Slavic studies, but this um, neglect of the study of culture with respect to Ukraine is particularly quizzical because we could argue that political Ukraine would not exist were it not for works of culture, were it not for Cossack uh, Dume, to, to folk songs, to romantic poems, that cajoled, persuaded, invited readers into the national project, and to modernist literature that debated and performed, in effect, uh, Ukraine and Europe uh, from the very start. And this brings us to an important point that um, is evident to, I think, most of you here, but it deserves repeating, particularly in Western scholarship and Slavonic studies. This is precisely the reason why the study of Ukrainian language is so critical. Any scholar or student of, of Ukraine um, needs to understand the language of the modern Ukrainian national idea. Um, it should have intellectual and institutional privilege in our work. And at the same time, without a knowledge of Russian, uh, other languages of Ukraine like Crimean Tatar, uh, we cannot understand uh, the aspirations, dreams, of uh, so many different groups and constituencies in contemporary Ukrainian culture. So in multilingual Ukraine, um, and when one looks at uh, multilingual Ukraine as an object of knowledge, as a student or as a scholar, you can't help but rejoice. There's so much material uh, to work with. If you're interested in uh, changing entire fields to contesting methodological nationalism, um, Ukraine offers so many remarkable and very exciting opportunities. Uh, a literary scholar, for instance, could study the early uh, German language uh, prose of Olya Kobylanska or Mike Johansson, the Ukrainian language polemical pamphlets of Nikola Khrilovy, the Russian language Samizdat or Samvedav poetry of Halkiv Boris Chichibabin, the late prose of the Crimean Tatar, uh, pro stylist Shamil Aliadin, and never leave the Ukrainian context at all. So for all our talk about Ukraine and Europe, this is Europe in Ukraine, or rather Europe's in the plural in Ukraine. Uh, let me tie things up so we can actually have a, a discussion. And I just want to point to a case that has fascinated me uh, individually for, for years. And that is the relationship of, of solidarity between Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars, a Sunni Muslim nation uh, right now under consistent threat from Russian occupiers in Ukraine, a Sunni Muslim people who have traditionally articulated and continue to articulate a strong Ukrainian patriotism. There used to be a maxim that we sometimes said with tongue-in-cheek, but today uh, it's a, a very well-recognized uh, truth and reality. Uh, that is, the, the greatest Ukrainians in Crimea are the Crimean Tatars. Now, in the social sciences, this relationship has often been dismissed in research literature as a quote-unquote marriage of convenience. But anyone paying attention since 2014 knows that that's a completely empty assessment. And it's really through the study of culture that we begin to see how this alliance and relationship is driven not only by 
practical and political concerns, but also an emotional, effective power. Uh, and this power comes from a literature that had a high mountain to climb. That is, in currents of cultural memory, uh, the relationship between the Ukrainians and Crimean Tatars has been uh, uh, radioactive in some moments. In Ukrainian cultural memory, for instance, the image of the Crimean Tatar raiding homes in the 16th and 17th centuries, raiding for slaves, um, has, has, has had lasting currency. In Crimean Tatar, currents of cultural memory, the image of Ukrainians participating in the dispossession uh, of the Crimean Tatars in the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries has left a very lasting scar. But there have been works in canonical Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar language literature that have worked to surmount this mutual, antagonist, uh, mutual antagonism, this mutual stereotyping. And, and this literature is uh, very deserving of our, of our study. And essentially, what this literature has done is helped us um, see a dynamic process of reflection between these two peoples. I mention this because it's really no small thing. Uh, it has implications uh, for European policy even. It's tangible and they're very real. Um, it speaks to the way Ukrainian culture and indeed Ukraine can teach us uh, and teach us just as they are teaching us um, on the front line in a struggle for what we might often call European ideals of territorial integrity, the rule of law. Because the Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar relationship has really helped secure civic nationalism in Ukraine. In other words, this relationship is not one of Crimean Tatar Muslims assimilating to Ukrainian society. Assimilation is largely the frame that we um, use to describe in integration of Muslim peoples in the European Union, for, in uh, for, for instance. But it's something much more symbiotic and mutually constructive. So this relationship has turned a Sunni Muslim nation into a shaper of national identity in the largest country within Europe, and also has advanced for us a model for, uh, of inter-ethnic solidarity um, that has great application uh, today. Uh, and, and something we need to pay attention to and focus on because it's ever more, ever more vulnerable under uh, conditions of Russian aggression. So um, that's where I'll leave it uh, right now. I'm looking forward to our discussion. Recht herzlichen Dank. Wir diskutieren in Deutschland und ich glaube, es ist keine Frage, dass in Deutschland der Begriff Nation für viele Deutsche ein schwieriger Begriff ist, weil er behaftet ist. Bei uns eher mit einer negativen Konnotation, denn unsere Generation und hier sitzt ja sogar noch die nächste, ähm, ist aufgewachsen mit den Schrecken, äh, in die eine Nation äh, sich hinein, sich und den Rest der Welt, muss man ja sagen, hineinbringen kann, wenn der Nationengedanke ähm, zu dem aggressiven Nationalismus wird, der das 20. Jahrhundert geprägt hat. Ähm, ich glaube, das ist eine der Hindernisse, die auf dem Weg Deutschland und Ukraine und einander verstehen oder Deutschland die Ukrainer verstehen. Einer der Hindernisse, die mit dem Maidan sehr schnell offengelegt worden ist. Denn die, die in Deutschland ähm, den Maidan nicht wahrhaben wollten und die auch auf der Seite derer standen, die meinten, die Ukraine solle der Vorhof äh, des russischen Imperiums oder der russischen Föderation bleiben, die haben sehr schnell bei der Hand gehabt den Verdacht, dass der Maidan eine nationalistische Bewegung sei. Äh, und alle wissen, dass Bandera da ein 
Wort ist, das nur in den Raum geworfen werden muss. Und eigentlich ist der Streit schon da. Und ich würde es, vielleicht können wir diese Frage der Nationenbildung und, wie Sie eben gesagt haben, sie ist nicht nur verbunden mit Schrecken. Das 20. Jahrhundert war natürlich voll von Schrecken für ganz Europa, insbesondere für die sogenannten Zwischenländer, wo die Grenzen immer hin und her gingen. Aber es war doch auch voll von Schrecken für die Ukraine. Wo sind die Seiten, die wir jetzt auch einmal hervorheben sollten? Und wie ist das mit dieser Nation auch noch mit einer Geschichte, wo die Sprache zu einem schwierigen Thema geworden ist, weil die ukrainische Sprache auch durch stalinistisches Wirken an den Rand geschoben worden ist, jetzt wieder über staatliche Entscheidungen stärker ins Zentrum rückt, damit aber sehr wohl auch Schwierigkeiten hervorruft. Vielleicht können wir entlang dieser Linie ein bisschen miteinander denken und reden. Vielleicht bist du jetzt dran, Volodymyr. Thank you very much. Should I speak English or Ukraine? They're on the same page with, with Rory. Uh, I, I would really like to, I, I think you raised wonderful points, Rory, so I will probably reflect upon that. So, uh, talking about nation, uh, I think we can try to, uh, I understand this fear in Germany with the word nation, right? Because European history asks us a very difficult question. What, is, what brings more cruelty, empire or nation? And, and basically, uh, the Ukrainians and Eastern Europeans uh, are, would rather answer this question that, of course, empires bring more uh, cruelty. While we know the, uh, the, the Central European history and um, the answer can be that nationalism brings more cruelty because it is xenophobic, etc. My answer would be that the cruelty is brought when the imperial idea and national idea go together. So when empires try to uh, use the nation as the vehicle for their expansion. So this basically, I, th I, I do think that it, it basically started in the 19th century with Napoleon. So how can we interpret the Napoleonic empire? Is it, is it a universalist empire? Is it in the form of uh, French nationalism? And obviously, the Napoleonic movement produced so much, you know, movement in, in Central and Southern and then Eastern Europe. But then we had, I think, around 19th, the mid-19th century, the, the big temptation to link the national idea with the imperial idea. And I think there are, there are two worlds which were going in the same direction, the German-speaking world and the Russian-speaking world. And the paradox is that if we look at the Russian Empire in mid-19th century, uh, we see how the idea of the nation, what, what it was called Narodnost at the time, was taken as a major vehicle of empire. And that means that if the nation, the Russian nation in this sense, is taken uh, uh, as a major vehicle of empire, you have all this assimilation, ban of uh, other languages, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, in this sense, I think the, for example, Germany, German-speaking world, let's say, because we can speak about Austro-Hungarian Empire, Habsburg Empire, and uh, the German experience, it basically took, uh, uh, it, 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 uh, it made a very important lesson that combining the imperial and the nation is a very bad thing. I don't think that the Russian world has taken this lesson and understood it in this way. So basically what we are now thinking with this concept of Russian world, etc., is, is basically the continuation of this uh, nation-imperial marriage. And this is what, what makes things so, uh, so difficult. Because if we, if we like, dig into the concept of nation or its synonyms, back to the 19th century, for example. We have the republican ideas the, about the nation, right? Uh, 
And that, that is what, uh, what is very dear to me. We have this utopia, uh, which was a utopia in 19th century, the Republic of Nations, or what, what the French call la République des peuples, the, the Republic of Peoples. So in some sense, today's Europe is something like this. Not perfect, but the Republic of, of Nations. So I try to inter interpret the, the Ukrainian uh, history with, the, with focusing not so much on the concept of nation, but on the concept of republic. So you can, you can read Ukrainian intellectual and political history as a kind of a constant idea that we should establish a republic in Eastern Europe, contrary to some kind of imperial project. And we can, we can dig uh, into the Cossack statehood with that, of course. We can, all these discussions between Cossacks and Tsars, you know, th this was a question of and that Cossacks were saying, look, we, we signed a treaty with you, okay? We are in contractual idea of politics, not the imperial idea of politics. So you can, you can see it throughout. You can see it, for example, in the history of Ruthenians, Historia Rusa, or the, the text that influenced very much the Ukrainian romantics. You, you, you see, you see this, uh, this line very often. Then you, if you think about, for example, major Ukrainian thinkers of the 19th century, I'm thinking primarily about Drahomanov, right? And, and Rahmanov was a person who was, well, he's very important right now for Ukrainians because it's an, it's an idea that the concept of nation should be modernized. It should not be that romantic, mystical, whatever. That the concept of the nation is a very modern, uh, modern concept and it, it basically should be very pluralistic. So that was his idea. And therefore, the, the Rahmanov is very important right now for Ukrainian intellectuals because if you take the, those ideas of modernizing nation like which is coming from the Nestor group or some circles in which I'm, I'm, I'm also working with. That's a very important idea, but it comes from this very interesting 19th century. So I would, I would, I would, I would, I would say in this way, it doesn't mean that the, uh, there is no problem of nationalism in Ukraine. I think there is. I think that there is a, a deep problem that uh, the patriotic-minded people are looking for their heroes somewhere which should, they should not be looking at. Uh, I don't think that the integral na nationalism of the 30s and the 40s is, a, is, a, is a, um, basically ori orientation. But if you look into the, um, the history of Ukrainian movement, you suddenly realize that it was not far right in its history mostly. It was, if we take Drahomana, it was it, it is classic liberal or even liberal socialist. If we take, for example, all the intellectuals up until... The, the, the 1970s, they were basically socialist liberals. So I would say about the, the major topic of Ukrainian intellectual history is the leftist idea of Ukraine, right? Because it was the kind of a, an idea how to combine the social emancipation and the national emancipation. And in many aspects, it was the same thing, right? And then, of course, you have this backlash in the 30s, understandable because of Stalinism, etc. But if you look, for example, on... Uh, Rory mentioned was six tools. If you look at um, the Ukrainian dissidents at Helsinki groups, I mean, it's all about kind of a liberal idea of the nation to me. It's it's an idea that you should combine the emancipation of the nation with the uh, with the individual rights, with liberal agenda, agenda post Helsinki agenda. Therefore, the Helsinki group was so important, and I think the work of Ukrainian dissidents of this generation is very important. And. Um, and, uh, and yeah, if, uh, if so, if if we try to redescribe the Ukrainian history in kind of uh, concepts that were very important for Europe as well, for, for the whole of Europe, I mean, this kind of a struggle between the republican idea of politics and the imperial idea of politics, I think it, it gives us lots of uh, lots of other other things to to think about. And uh, we already mentioned uh, Crimean Tatars. Of course, it's not only from the 2014, I'm thinking, for example, of one of the greatest Ukrainian uh, scholar of the early 20th century, Agatha Gil Krimsky, who was basically a person who ran the, uh, the Ukrainian Academy of Sciences, who created all this Ukrainian Orientalism, uh, Orientalist studies, who wrote history of Turkey, his history of Persia, history of Hazars, very important, by the way. And he was a uh, a dissident from a Crimean Tatar mullah who uh, left uh, left Crimea and uh, took Christianity in, uh, I think it was during the 
Lithuanian Polish com Commonwealth. So it's also a very interesting topic, this kind of inter intersection, be interaction between religious and how people were converting, reconverting. Lots of stories how, you know, people were converting from different forms of Christianity between Christianity and, and Islam, etc. Et so it's really, uh, to, to sum up, I think uh, Ukrainian example can be an example how, a very difficult story, by the way, how you build a, a nation state, a civic nation, but continue to be a multinational society. Because what we see right now is that in Europe we, we see two different patterns, I think. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. You see the countries that used to be empires and therefore were creating this colonial world, post-colonial world, and of course they were more easily going into this multi multinational or post-colonial thinking. But then you have the truly nation states uh, that emerged after the First World War and then Second World War, which we see that multinationalism in Central Europe is not a very, you know, understandable, uh, understandable idea. So for Ukraine, it's a very, very interesting, very difficult task. How, how, without this imperial experience, how to try to be a civic nation, but at the same time, which will be multinational, multi-ethnic. Schönen Dank. Ähm, ich will haben Sie noch äh, versuche Sie zu verdonnern, dass Sie auf dem noch ein Stück weitergehen. Die Nation durchaus positiv. Sie kann durchaus positiv behaftet sein als Begriff. Der imperialistische Staat nicht. Aber historisch gesehen war das zaristische Russland und äh, Österreich-Ungarn, imperialistische Staaten, die aber Multinationalität und Multilingualität zugelassen haben, anders als Preußen, das dann mit der homogenen Staatsidee, übrigens auch antirepublikanisch, dann auf der Bildfläche erschienen ist. Und jetzt haben wir die Ukraine heute immer noch in ungesicherten Grenzen mit Yalta schon ein Stück verschoben nach Westen, so wie auch Polen verschoben worden ist. Aber wenn wir uns den Sprachraum anschauen, Sie hatten zum Teil aufgezählt, Polnisch, ähm, Ukrainisch, Russisch, Jiddisch. Ähm, es gibt jetzt Konflikte mit Ungarn wegen der ungarischen Minderheiten. Wie, welche Rolle wird jetzt die Sprache und damit die Literatur auf dieser Chance, die die Ukraine äh, ja nur mal mit einem kurzen Zeitfenster hatte, nach 1917, wie wird dies, diese Chance jetzt entwickelt? Und was wird, was passiert mit der Tatsache, dass das Russische sehr massiv besetzt worden war, aber inzwischen auch zum Teil eine Identifikation der Menschen ist. Ich weiß das auch so besser. Und erinnere mich an tief besorgte Anrufe von Freunden aus Odessa, die, als das Sprachengesetz in der Rada war, sagten, das bedeutet, dass wir ausgeschlossen werden sollen mit unserer Muttersprache weiß ich inzwischen, sie, ihre Eltern sind mal ausgeschlossen worden von der jüdischen Sprache, abgeschnitten worden äh, durch Stalin. Wie gibt es jetzt einen harmonischen Weg, äh, auch gerechten und fairen Weg, um in diese Nation, die sich aber, die sich ihrer Multi Lateralität und ihrer Multilingualität bewusst ist. Wie kann sie damit umgehen? Braucht sie die Staatssprache? Wie geht das weiter? Ich finde das extrem spannend. Und über diesen Stein stolpert man als politisches, als Politikum, egal wo man anfängt, sich zu artikulieren oder Politik zu machen und zu kommunizieren in der Ukraine. Uh, first of all, just the very fact that I am putting 
this on my uh, head um, to <clears throat> hear a Ukrainian translation from German to speak in English here. Uh, the first thought I have in my head is, this is so Ukrainian. Uh, because, of course, in Ukraine, moving across languages is, is so common. Um, and I say this just to make a simple point that um, language politics in Ukraine is, is very overblown. Um, it's obviously um, something of concern in policymaking circles. And there's always a danger in over-legislating um, human practice, human behavior. Um, I think most Ukrainians would agree that language politics have become political football because they're able to stand in and substitute for other more pressing and more difficult social, social cultural, socioeconomic problems that political elites rarely seek to solve. Um, that said, I think there's also a problem we have in the academic sphere, and I'd like to return to that for a moment, because um, we tend to study uh, language use as a, uh, particularly in the West, as a zero-sum game. So uh, the dynamic is very black and white, either or. Uh, the traditional representation and description of Ukraine as divided between a Ukrainian-speaking West and a Russian-speaking East is an epistemic failure and continual epistemic failure on our part to acknowledge that um, a, a, a Ukrainian-speaking um, citizen of Lviv could also potentially uh, speak Russian and that a Russian speaker in Kharkiv or Donetsk could speak Ukrainian. In the West, we fail to understand that that lively bilingualism is a very lived reality for Ukrainians. I think a lot of it comes down to the way we study in the social sciences language use according to charts and typographies. We put people in various boxes, but we fail to actually explore and study the lived experience of a multilingual Ukrainian subject who is encountering and using different languages um, all the time over the course of the day. My best friend, for instance, one from Kiev, speaks Ukrainian at home. His wife is from Berdyansk. She speaks Russian at home. Um, it, it's a very common thing uh, for that relationship and that kind of relationship to exist. We in the West have a difficult time uh, I say as someone who used to be a very monolingual American, uh, to understand this dynamic multilinguality, this dynamic multilingualism. Which also brings me back a little bit to Voldemort's excellent observations about the uh, connections and, and, and uh, challenges um, between concepts of empire and nationhood, and particularly nationalism, because you mentioned uh, Maidan. And for me, uh, I felt as though the discourse about Maidan was um, so problematic here in the West because we fail to really understand what nationalism is. Um, we conflate it, usually in popular discourse, with ethnic integral nationalism. Uh, we fail to remember that it is a broad concept, um, just like capitalism. There are various variants of capitalism. There are various variants of um, nationalism. And as Volodymyr mentioned, the, the center of gravity in the Ukrainian national project has been indeed civic. And one only needs to look at a map to understand why. Um, Ukraine and the story of Ukraine is astounding because it represents three different peripheries of empire that came together and did something that no peripheries of empire had done before in joining together in this threeness to found a new center. Usually peripheries of uh, empire uh, return and uh, gravitate back to the imperial center in some way. But in the case of Ukraine, you see this defiance of uh, geopolitical, sociocultural gravity. It's a remarkable thing. Uh, and an ethnic conception alone of Ukrainian nationhood could not sustain that kind of physics. So there had to be buy-in from people like Krimsky um, and, and so many others who come from a variety of ethnic backgrounds who had an idea of Ukrainian citizenship that was founded on a value. Um, one of the most common words in Shevchenko's poetry is volya, uh, freedom, but also a kind of will. And this was developed in contradistinction to aristocracy to the West in Poland and autocracy to the East in Russia. For me, I feel like a lot of the Western academic discourse, both about nationalism, which I, I, it tends to be simplistic, and also language use, is simply not accounting for the unique 
singularity of, of Ukraine. That is, we've typically applied models of language use or models of nationhood to Ukraine when we should be using Ukraine to reshape our understandings and our models of nationhood and language use. Um, this is where, again, Ukraine for us here in Germany, or the United Kingdom for that matter, represents a remarkable uh, epistemic knowledge-based opening. We're slowly starting to walk in and enter it. Um, but it's, in many respects, come uh, a, a bit too late. Uh, and that's something that troubles me you know, deeply. Um, yeah. <laughs> Ähm, noch mal, ich versuche sie noch einen Schritt weiter zu treiben. Die Aufgabe ist ja Ukraine in Europa und nicht mehr vor Europa, immerhin. Ähm, kann äh, Westeuropa, die älteren Demokratien, die, die schon äh, Zeit hatten, ihre Demokratien zu entwickeln vor 1990, können Sie Rollenbeispiele sein für die Ukraine oder umgekehrt? Wird möglicherweise die Ukraine, weil wir im Westen doch sehr stark an, dem, an der Idee der homogenen Sprache und der homogenen Nationalität, und das ist ein Ergebnis des Nationalsozialismus und dieses, dieser dramatischen Zerstörung der Vielfalt von Europa gewesen, kann es sogar so sein, dass wenn die Ukraine erfolgreich ist, sie uns vormacht, wie Multilateralität, Multilingualität, Multiethnizität, obwohl vieles davon unwiederbringlich zerstört worden ist, wie weite Teile des jüdischen Lebens in der Ukraine, genau wie bei uns, kann es möglicherweise dahin gehen, oder läuft die Ukraine mehr oder weniger gezwungenermaßen in ein Riesendilemma hinein, weil der Osten äh, nunmehr unter faktisch russischsprachiger oder sogar russischer Hoheit mit der Setzung der russischen Sprache einschließlich Hochschulabschlüssen, Universitätszugängen etc., getrennt wird durch die Nationenbildung, die jetzt stattfindet auf Basis der ukrainischen Sprache als Staatssprache. Maybe I can simply and, and quickly uh, answer this question because I think Volodymyr would be a, a, a better authority uh, like so many uh, uh, issues. Um, um, Most Ukrainians themselves, uh, if we rely on very consistent polling over the, the last 10 years alone, most, um, in, in, in very large numbers in fact, um, there are steady majorities with the view that Ukrainian should be the sole official language in the country. Um, it's something like 27 to 30 percent perhaps um, entertain the idea of Russian as an official language of the country. Um, I think there are ways to, and the Constitution of Ukraine has a, a number of allowances, of course, to protect the free development of various languages in the country. Um, but I do think that, you know, having one official language in a uh, multilingual environment um, is, is, is doable. We're seeing how it, it, it uh, is unfolding in Ukraine today. Um, and again, I think we need only here in the West to follow I guess the feelings and sentiments of so many Ukrainians themselves as they represent them in Poland. But Volodymyr, what do you think? I, by the way, I don't think that Ukrainians are better authority in Ukrainian matters because uh, very often what we hear from you, from people who are looking at us from outside, is, is really re uh, revealing. So I, I don't think we should have this kind of idea that we understand it better. Um, I think that, uh, well, Ukrainian and Russian are in a very, uh, has interestingly changed, changed places because historically Ukrainian was a language of the people and Russian was a language of, uh, I don't know, of power, right? Of uh, administration, whatever. And of the cities. Of the cities, yes. So now it's, it's kind of interesting because um, 
Ukrainian is uh, increasingly the language of administration, of education, etc. And people really changing this. So my metaphor is that Ukrainian is, is turning kind of a Latin, you know, a, a, a Latin language for uh, in, in the Ukrainian lands. And, and Russian is turning, not always, of course, but in the, uh, to the language of, you know, if you, if you take some regions, the language of everyday youth. So it's interesting how they're changing the roles. Second thing, uh, we don't have, well, as, as, as I said, in many aspects, Ukraine, Ukrainians are now facing a situation that is not really typical. So, for example, we cannot compare it with the language uh, situation in Baltic states, because in Baltic states, many aspects you have, you know, uh, these linguistic things are going into the enclaves, right? You have the Russian-speaking enclave, you have the Lithuanian-speaking enclave, or Latvian-speaking enclave, right? Uh, we can't compare it to, to Belgian case or to Switzerland case. It's, it's different because, as, as Rory said, it's kind of a dynamic multilingualism. So you can start a sentence in Ukrainian, continue it in Russian, and end it in Ukrainian. It's, it's a very typical thing. So it's, it's much more fluid, and in this case, uh, interesting, we, we also should not exclude the importance of the Polish language, for example. Many of my friends from Western Ukraine, they were educated for looking, uh, watching Polish television, right? And it's, it's, it's also a very interesting, very interesting aspect. But I think we should not, coming back again to this, you know, national imperial thing, we should not underestimate the, the kind of this imperial potential of, of Russian language as a soft power. Because imagine how, how much product is created in Russian language. Uh, not not in Ukraine, not only in Ukraine, but in Russia itself. Imagine how it, for example, is in, uh, how the, the young people, or not only the young people, are watching Russian language YouTube and the uh, Russian language bloggers on TikTok or whatever else. So, watching Russian historical mov uh, movies, etc., etc. So, in this case, I mean, sometimes we present this like Ukrainian nationalism is fighting against Russian-speaking uh, cosmopolitanism, which is not the case, because Often we are, we are talking about Russian nationalism as well, and uh, it, it is also very important to to understand this. So I think the question of identity is also very different in Eastern Europe and in, in Western Europe. In Western Europe, uh, as, as I see it, in America, for example, there is a clear, uh, uh, clear, uh, clear fear of the of the word identity, and I understand why because. We talk about identity politics. You immediately are thinking about Brexit, Trump, etc. While in in, U in Ukraine, in Eastern Europe, I think this kind of a linkage between the liberal agenda and the patriotic agenda uh, is still alive. It's still alive. So in many ca cases, you can you can talk that look, uh, identity is a kind of a also the uh, our vehicle against the empire. So identity can also be this, this, this vehicle of building up the republican idea, well, pluralistic but the republican idea, but because otherwise you would have a homogeneous, homogeneous Russian empire. But again, uh, uh, let me be now critical with regard to my country. It's also very important to, to be critical uh, while you're, you're, you're a patriot, for example. I think uh, this internationalism and, and pluralism in Ukraine is a kind of rather an ideal type, type than reality. So it doesn't mean that Ukraine is an ideal pluralistic society. No, there is lots of xenophobia, lots of hatred, and uh, we see it. And uh, with regard to well, Ukrainian speakers against Russian speakers, uh, uh, Christians against Muslims, by the way. Uh, if you create, as a journalist, we created recently a story about uh, a, a Muslim girl, not Crimean Tatar, but an uh, ethnic Ukrainian who adopted uh, Islam. And we had lots of, you know, problematic, to say the least, comments on, on, on Facebook. But probably it's everywhere else. So I, I think it's kind of a, we should think about it as an ideal type, but not underestimate the, 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 the big problematic issues that, 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 that exist. And the final point is, you mentioned cities. So I'm asking myself why, for example, Ukrainians survived uh, both the, 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 the Russian Empire, let's remember that Ukraine was banned for half a, half a century right, in the Russian Empire, uh, banned from public use, um, and uh, why it survived what is called linguistic, uh, starting from the Stalinism, etc. 
I don't think the, the answer is, because it's very important how, I'm, I'm thinking about Stalinism as a kind of um, uh, a historicizing hierarchy uh, project, uh, because uh, the, the, the Stalin's idea, the Stalin's concept of former people, it's very important. Uh, it, it, he is taking from Gorky, Bivshi Ludi. So an idea that we should move farther to history and uh, we should forget our past, or we should kill those people who are Bivshi Ludi, the, the bourgeoisie, the kulaks, the kulkuls, the peasants, etc., etc. And um, and that means that there was this vehicle of amnesia, a very important vehicle of amnesia. When I'm asking myself, for example, why Babin Yad that we discussed yesterday, why it was so un unmemorialized in the Soviet Union? I have two explanations. The first explanation is that there was the rise of anti-Semitism out of the Second World War, and let's not forget that basically the Jewish culture was uh, primarily exterminated in, uh, in, in, in late 40s, early 50s. So there was, after the Holocaust, there was a huge rise of anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union. But the second thing is that I think in the Soviet Union was developing kind of idea that remembering is bad. Remembering your origins is bad. So it's better to have amnesia. You, you die Opfer des Faschismus, die patriotischen Opfer des Faschismus, das war schon okay derer sich zu erinnern. Die patriotischen Opfer des Faschismus, die wurden an jedem 8. Mai gefeiert, aber eben nicht Opfer des Nationalsozialismus, zum Beispiel die jüdisch gewesen waren. Das war das Tabu. Yeah, so, uh, so, and this kind of, a, so people, lots of stories like that, that people who having Ukrainian speakers in their families, peasants, when they're moving to cities, they, they it's, it's, all, it's an old family, they, they just forget the language specifically, to, not to become this brief with the former people, right? So, but the, the Ukrainian language in many aspects, I think, it, it like preserved itself because the urbanization was not that high. Now we have much, much higher ur urbanization. So the question is that we can ask, whether despite the Ukrainian language as a state language, etc., whether these dynamics of cities, which are in, in central and eastern southern Ukraine, are mostly Russian speakers, well, whether it's also not a danger for Ukrainian language, even now, maybe even not, uh, not as less as uh, during previous efforts. Therefore, I think it is important for Ukrainian state to kind of promote Ukrainian language. Uh, but it doesn't mean that some, some people are you know, banned from using Russian, whatever. We basically see Russian all the time on, on media, in everyday life, etc., etc. So I think this, this dynamic multilingualism is really something, something very interesting. And it's also interesting how Ukrainians adopt uh, this, this identity. Me, for example, I'm coming from Kiev, from a very Russian-speaking family. So for me, I, I came up with the idea one day with the metaphor that for me, uh, Ukrainska rydna, ale vivchina. So it's, it's, it's a mother tongue, but it's a, a tongue that I learned at a certain moment. I remember when I was 20 years old, I was not really being able to write in uh, big texts in Ukraine. So I was from a Russian-speaking city of Kiev. And it's, it's important, I think, the, to see those people, how, how you choose it as an, as an identity which is not only an identity, eth ethnic identity. That's, I think it's very important to see it as a civic identity. Therefore, the very interesting stories is how people of other nationalities were choosing Ukraine. So Rory uh, mentioned Mike Johansson. We can mention Yuri Shvilov, also German by origin. We can mention uh, Klinsky. We can mention Polish intellectuals like Antonovich or Lipinski and many, many others. You know, It's very interesting topic. Wir haben, also erstens sind Sie aufgefordert, sich einzumischen, wenn Sie möchten. Ja, ich sehe es schon, Dankeschön. Ich darf ganz kurz noch einen Aspekt nachschieben. Wir haben heute Nachmittag mit Sergei Sardan zusammengesessen. Ich glaube, alle wissen, dass er mit Jugendlichen arbeitet in der Ostukraine, im Bereich Theater, sich artikulieren, Sprache verwenden lernen, würden diese jungen Menschen oder 
In welcher Sprache artikulieren Sie sich derzeit? Ich vermute nach wie vor Russisch, oder? Die, die bei Jai, mit Jaidan zusammenarbeiten in der Ostukraine. Kann das jemand von euch beiden sagen? Did you have a translation? Oh, you wanted me. Excuse me. No, I didn't switch. Okay. Oh, you can. I, I okay, heard okay, you. okay, okay, okay. Excuse me. Okay. Um, I would say they speak both, or okay. they speak more than one. Okay, so not such a problem. Right. Okay. Bilingualism. Okay. <laughs> Natasha and over you. Yes. Or you start, Natasha. Guten Abend. Vielen Dank für die interessante Einführung und die Diskussion. Ich habe zwei Fragen und zwei Kommentare. Die Nationalbildungsprozesse in der Ukraine, sowohl in den 20er Jahren als auch jetzt in der modernen Ukraine, waren und sind ständigem Einfluss aus Russland ausgesetzt. Auch in Deutschland wird Russland mit der ganzen Sowjetunion assoziiert. Somit wird die Ukraine oft mit Russland assoziiert. Das trifft man in Museen, in den Ausstellungen, wenn man mit Gruppen unterwegs ist, dass wenn man sagt, dass man aus der Ukraine kommt und man meint, dass schon durch die Medien durchgedrungen ist, dass die Ukraine nicht Russland ist, trotzdem kommt es oft zu diesen Assoziationen. Meine Frage ist, wie kann die Wahrnehmung der Ukraine in Deutschland, in der EU und der Welt verändert werden? Und wie kann ein klares Bild der Ukraine ins Ausland transportiert werden, wenn eben ähm, es oft instrumentalisiert wird und das ganze Prozess noch nicht abgeschlossen ist? Vielen Dank. Okay, und vielleicht gleich noch die zweite Frage dazu. My question is actually very short and it's directed to Mr. Finnen. So I was a bit irritated, to be honest, about one phrase you used in your beginning speech, opening speech. And it was the, the phrase of Ukrainian Europe. So I have no idea what you mean by Ukrainian Europe. I mean, there, now there is a nation of Ukraine. I'm not playing the national party or anything. That's not the point, but I don't understand it. We're not talking about the German Europe or something, or English, British Europe or something. I don't understand the phrase, and I don't understand what you want to tell with it, and why do you distinct it from Ukraine as a nation or Ukraine, and what in distinction to this would mean Ukrainian Europe. Thank you for your for your uh, your your comment, and I understand the irritation because I felt it myself. Um, what do I mean by Ukraine and Europe? It was really the topic uh, of today's discussion, and I tried to think through um, some helpful ways to discuss Ukraine and Europe, and that's why I began with this academic frame to see how Ukrainian studies in Europe is is growing and evolving. Um, I do, under no circumstances, want to convey that there is some kind of specific Ukraine for Europe or some specific Europe for Ukraine. Europe is a moving target for everyone. Um, we're always wondering uh, and curious about its meaning. Is this a political project? Is it an idea? Is it a set of values? Um, Europe means so many different things at so many different times. So really beginning to discuss it, you know, in um, a setting like this one is... is um, is very challenging. So I only meant to really speak to the question of Ukrainian studies in Europe. That's really my only intention. And I think that story is um, uh, a very uh, bright and promising one, which brings us to the question of, of how to change this view of Ukraine as, as part of Russia or influenced by um, Russia in, in the West, which is a perennial problem. And I think, going back to what I was mentioning earlier, um, that it's really the, the role of culture, I think, here um, that makes the biggest difference. That uh, Ukraine's image will change and is changing due to its vibrant uh, cultural works. Um, one of the most active theaters in all of Europe is, is the Dach Theater, which has produced uh, Dach Daughters and Dach Braka music groups that are going in, um, around the world. And... Uh, channeling uh, new energies of Ukrainian culture, playing with lots of different currents of Ukrainian traditions, and uh, channeling them in new ways with new sounds um, from international contexts. And I think that's really 
um, the one thing we have to always rely on is, is the work of culture to, um, and our receptivity to culture, and Ukrainian culture in particular, and its difference from these predominant, uh, rather simplistic frames that we sometimes bring because we've all been influenced by the, the soft power projects, uh, particularly from um, the Russian Federation and the Soviet Union. They, they linger on in the way we structure our understandings of, of, of Eastern Europe. We need to break through them, and at the same time, I think, uh, let, letting culture lead the way in this regard is the most effective approach. I will try to also reply to two questions. My, my German is not that good, so maybe I misunderstood some, some questions, so it, you, you are supposed to answer the very easy question, how do we bring Ukraine and the awareness to Europe? <laughs> Let me start with this European uh, Europe question. Uh, it's interesting that uh, now I think there are little, not so many people, at least in Ukraine, who doubt that Ukraine is Europe, right? And uh, if, if you look at the polls, you can see that the idea that Ukraine should become a European Union state is increasing. So when I, when I meet Western Europeans, I'm telling, look, you can't imagine, well, I know that you, uh, in Western Europe there is all, there is all you know, self-criticism about Europe and we are not in the moment 1989, you know, we are, we are not in this optimistic Fukuyamist end of history and everything was fine, etc. So uh, now we are in this very sometimes skeptic mood here in, 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 in Germany and France, as, as, as I see from outside. For an Eastern European, uh, for Ukrainians, it's, it's a, a, of course very strange to see that because uh, the problem is that uh, I think there is kind of a lack of faith in Europe inside the European Union. And in this case, Ukrainian case is very interesting how Ukrainians really believe in Europe, maybe uh, kind of utopically believe in Europe, but believe much more than EU citizens sometimes, it seems to me. But um, the, the, the thing is, if you, if you go in history, if, for example, when Byron was writing his famous uh, poem Mazepa, he was basically constructing, he, he never been to Ukraine, of course, but he was basically constructing this uh, Ukrainian uh, steppes or desert, as he called it, as a basically Asian steppe. So for, for Western Europeans of the early 19th century, quite often the stereotype was well, first, that Ukrainians and Tatars are the same, and it's also very interesting how the image of Mazepa was turning into the image of a Tatar, uh, Tatar leader. Very interesting right now to understand it. So, but even if, if you go to people like who were constructing this image of Europe in Central Europe, like my favorite is Milan Kundera, and he's writing the tragedy of Central Europe in uh, 83. He was basically cutting the clear line between Central Europe, what he called kidnapped West, and all the rest, which he called Russia and a separate civilization. So there comes a problem, uh, of course, and in the past several decades, we see how this European idea is going farther and farther east. So for Kundera, the end of Europe was in Uzhgorod. Now I think it's, it's obvious that, that it's far, far east uh, to the east. So uh, I think it's, it's, it's interesting to, to, to think about it, Ukraine and Europe, also not from the perspective of Ukraine, but from the perspective also of the idea of Europe which is enlarging itself, much, much wider than institutions. And coming, coming back to the question of Russian and, um, and Ukrainian, here I think, well, I'm, I'm now based in Vienna, I came to the Leopold Museum, I think, and there is a room or Albertina, I don't remember. Uh, there is a room of Russian avant-garde. And in Russian avant-garde, there are key painters, uh, Polish-Ukrainian Malevich and uh, Jewish-Belarusian Chagall, right? So, and why it is called Russian avant-garde? Because Russian is perceived, Russian is a concept that designs empire, but it perceived as designing a nation. And that's very interesting. If, if you look at studies, for example, not Ukrainian studies, but if I, I sometimes look at how, for example, people who are dealing with other regions of the world, very good historians, how they, what names they using to, to call, for example, medieval Rus, with the same term in Kyiv. And they use adjective Russian. 
So for, for many people, it was the Russian, Kiev, Kiev and Russia. And okay, if, if, we don't, if they don't use Kiev and Russia, they use uh, Russian princes, for example, or Russian principalities, which I think is a big historical problem because uh, Kiev and Rus was not Russia, it was not Ukraine, it was not Belarus, it was something else. And uh, my metaphor is that if we look at the uh, map of West of, of Europe in 19, uh, 10th century, you will see that, for example, the German lands were called Eastern Frontier. It doesn't mean that you, you are saying that, uh, well, German lands are basically French or Eastern France, or whatever, because you, you differentiate between Frankish and French, for example. So this intellectual job has been done uh, here, but it hasn't been done, for example, with regard to Eastern Europe, uh, with, with very easy question of names. So you, you can't really use the adjective Russian. Uh, when you're talking about medieval, uh, medieval uh, Middle Ages, right? Yeah. But this defines everything, because if you're, if you're saying that, look, Kiev was a, a mother of Russian cities, and, and even uh, the kingdom of Galicia and Lodomeria was a, a Russian principality, that means basically that you're very anachronistic, but that means that you are interpret uh, the imperial concepts in terms of national concepts, and that means that, well, where is Ukraine? Ukraine didn't exist in many years doesn't mean that we should uh, use the adjective Ukrainian to Kiev, Kiev and Rus. I'm also against it. But we, we, should, we should understand that it was changing. And the Russian nation didn't appear in 19 uh, or in, in 10th century. It appeared much, much later. So I think that these intellectual tools which are common for studying Western Europe, Central Europe, they should also be open. Because sometimes it seems to me that people who are writing this, they're basically prisoners of this Russian imperial history written in the 19th century. So that, that, that's part of the parts of the work we should all do, I think. Schönen Dank. Ich glaube, ich werde sehr präzise mit der Zeit sein, weil Sie noch einen sehr langen Abend vor sich haben und wir gerade erst der Anfang sind. Zwei Nachbemerkungen von mir. Erstens, selbst, dass eine selbst so fortschrittliche Organisation wie Open Society die Ukraine bei dem eurasischen Referat ansiedelt, macht mich immer total zornig. Ja, das ist, ist so eine kleine, ein kleiner Schwenk. Shall I switch to English? Maybe it would be easier. Um, You know, it's just this little tiny sign, Eurasia. And I always say, no, it's Europe. The second idea which I have is I'm really astonished how little time it seemingly takes to make forget. And that with Yalta, Yalta being on Crimea, this dividing Europe into two that it was so successful in a negative way to make us in the West forget. Almost everything about the variety of the history of the languages, uh, which has, ha has taken place before 45. And, and how long it takes to bring this back again, how many little tiny steps you need. Um, I think I know what I'm talking about, being, having been a politician for such a long time, really fighting for knowledge, just knowledge, the gain of knowledge, which starts with geography, with maps, with names of cities, uh, that even names have changed. <laughs> Lemberg, Louis, Louvre, just take that city, you know what, you've, what you can find all that. But that is Europe. And that actually is the fascinating side of Europe. So, what we have now in Western Europe, which is almost synonymous to European Union, a, I think very dangerous debate, and we saw it with, we see it with France. Because we, are, we don't only have Ukraine and Middle Eastern Europe, we have the Western Balkans, which actually made their way. We want to go west also, and what we see is a pretty disastrous situation 
because somebody like the French president claims we will not open the door. Um, and even more than Germany, the very, very convinced Europeans who think we should even deepen the basis and the relationship within the European Union, that means excluding others to join us because then the mess will be perfect. We have the mess already with 28. Think about some more coming and not having new institutions, new way of decisions and so on. That is one of the reasons why Macron stopped. Uh, 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 and I think did a big harm to expectations in Western Europe, and I think Kremlin will understand to use that sign. And uh, I think for Ukraine, this is one of the dangerous uh, parts at the moment, uh, and it is our obligation within Europe to understand, and who looks at the Belarusian border at the moment does understand that we must accept instability if uh, Ukraine and other countries don't get the chance to get a strong stand within Europe and is being seen as ours. Because everything else with, unfortunately, a neighbor in the East, which we have like it is at the moment, will go on creating instability. So it's also about even interests. Once in a while it helps to talk about interests and not only about <laughs> moral and good thinking and values and so on. So yes, I think the way we have uh, been going together is not so bad. I remember the German debate when Joschka Fischer, foreign minister at that time, wanted to loosen the visa regime with Ukraine. And there was a huge outcry in Germany. He almost lost his ministry because what was the public debate? All we will get is prostitutes and the car dealers. This debate would not take place anymore today. So I think if we ask if, if the glass is half full or half, half empty, it definitely is half full. The next generation will do even better. So, no reason to be pessimistic, although there are so many things to be pessimistic about in this world in those days, but I think not about Ukraine. Thank you both, and thank you, uh, Bundeszentrale, for this wonderful possibility to speak. And have a lot of fun for the rest of the evening. I left my knee in Odessa, that is, I will go home uh, and put uh, my leg where it should be, up in bed. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you guys for being here and coming. Okay.